I have a question for you. Okay. What? So what do you think about um, class discussion? I'm for it. Does it work out well for you? No, hardly ever. <laughs> Why? I don't know. They won't talk. I say, you know, maybe we should have a version of the Milgram experiment where I can control the amount of shock you get through each seat. And then if you don't respond within 10 seconds, I go, Meh, I can crank it up. They have a Simpsons version of that, too. Very funny. Extended University presents Tech Snack Stories. Our topic for this episode, Classroom Discussion. I don't know, maybe you should just briefly describe the problem that we're trying to address. Okay. Who Am I the main narrator here, or is it mostly, like, is this a kind of a dialogue where someone's asking questions to me, and, and I'm asking questions back, or should we just talk? I think it's a more of a discussion. Okay. You know, amongst colleagues. You know, right. people trying to solve a problem versus a moderator. Right. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, the idea that we came to in talking to a number of professors... Um, this semester and last semester, actually, is um, this question of discussion and how do we get students to talk about things uh, in class so that they're not just sitting there listening to the professor talk the whole time. Yeah. Um, and so what I started wondering was, what, why, like, we all insist that discussion is important and everyone seems to recognize that. But right. But they usually suck. They're usually not engaging, and students don't know how to have those conversations in a classroom setting. And online ones are even worse, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, having been an online student and participating in online discussions, they're usually just so empty. You know, somebody is making a declarative statement because that's what they've been instructed to do, and then... Your classmates have been instructed to reply to you, so then they say, that's a great declarative statement that you just made, and I absolutely agree with you. And good job. Good job. That's a good, that's a good, this is a good discussion we're having right now. <laughs> and it just is so, it's just so, um, what's the word I'm looking for? So artificial. Right. There's, it, it's, it's not, it's like the theory of a conversation rather than an actual conversation. Right. That's a good, I think that's a good way to put it. So, so that, I guess that's part of what we're trying to explore here is, is why are we, why are we having discuss? why do we insist on discussion in the first place? Uh, and how can we, how can we make it better? Is it really helping students learn? And if it's supposed to help students learn, then how, what are the best, most effective ways of engaging them in discussion, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, because I think we've all had really great discussions before. Every instructor and every student has had a really good discussion that they've experienced. So How I think, we do that more often. Yeah, I think they're, it's, people are always trying to replicate that experience. They have this Socratic dialogue in their head that they want their students to participate in. So they're always looking for that, that perfect discussion. So that comment that we've all had great discussions before, but just don't necessarily know how to recreate them in the classroom setting kind of put me on the hunt. And thinking back on my own experience as a student participating in classroom discussions, I decided to contact someone who I thought might be able to give us a little bit of insight. Hi, Jonathan. This is Lindsay. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, so I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, to state your name and just say a little bit about what you do. So I'm Jonathan Hess. I'm a professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, I teach in Germanic and Slavic languages and literature. I've been here 23 years. And I teach a wide range of courses from first-year seminars taught in English to fifth-semester German language courses to upper-level seminars uh, taught in German for our majors and minors, also outreach courses for general undergraduate for the general undergraduate population, and graduate seminars as well. Wow, so that's that's a wide range. 
Um, and I wanted to I, t- I wanted to talk to you in this context because first of all you're a great instructor. Uh, I had you for several courses over the course of my graduate studies. Um, and I remember thinking after every class period, you know, um, wow, those were some really some really great conclusions we just made as a group. Um, how did he get us there without dominating the discussion? But so I wanted you to just talk a little bit about the process because I know that there is a process. Um, what are some of the steps that you take? Um, I, it all depends on the level of the course. It's probably best for me to talk about undergraduate courses. For the graduate courses, it usually comes in, you know, you want to think about what do, what do students need to have to know, what concepts do they need to have to work through until we can get to the real interesting issues where there are sort of unresolved issues. And so, I, I mean, a lot of what I do in set up the discussion is sort of a pyramid, sort of, you know, basic things you want people to rehash. Um, you know, and then move into sort of more specific problems where I don't have an answer and guide discussion that way. Um, I find that in many ways much easier than sort of undergraduate teaching. I, I mean, I love undergraduate teaching, but it's challenging because students don't have the same motivation necessarily. Um, they may be motivated by grades. Um, and they don't necessarily have the same level of intellectual interest. They may be coming from all different backgrounds. This may be a course for their major, or it may be a course that just fit in their schedule. So, um, um, Yeah, I, I, I'm really interested in, in, especially at the undergraduate level, like you said, um, what are what are some of the specific like moves you make or steps you take in the discussion when you when you start it up and maybe if there's a lull? I mean, a lot happens before class. Um, what I sort of figured out probably about 10 years ago is that students just, I should have figured this out earlier, they don't necessarily, they don't automatically do the reading or do the reading in the way that you want to. And I can't stand teaching a class when students aren't prepared because you can't discuss if they haven't um, prepared. So in my undergraduate classes, um, actually in just about every undergraduate class I teach, for every reading assignment, there are questions that they need to answer and turn it on Sakai. That's our course management system. Um, and these aren't, I mean, I read the questions, I read everyone's answers, and they get credit for doing it, and I give them a grade, but they're not really graded per such, the, per se. The idea is really to get the students to read and think actively before class, so they have some idea why they're reading this text, what they're supposed to be responding to. And so, you know, they can get full credit for wrong answers. That doesn't matter. The point is that they just, they write and they think actively before they come into class. Um, and this also gives me a mechanism to give them credit for doing the reading, which I think is right. very important because so much of what they do for a class is reading, and often that's never reflected in their grade. Um, so that's what I—that's that, sort of how I sell it to them. But for me, this helps even before class starts because I can see what they understood, what they didn't understand, what made no sense to them, what the you know things that I thought might be challenging that they get immediately. So that's a, that's very useful. And I try to always read them before class. Um, what I, f- I have a first year seminar I'm doing now. We have 23 people. Um, you can't spend a lot of time in a group like that having the sort of discussion you would have in a graduate seminar because then you have three people who talk and dominate, um, and the rest of the people don't, you know, are passive. So I do a lot of, um, in a class like that, I might start with a general um, discussion question, and I use PowerPoint usually. It helps them, I think, if they can read at the same time as they hear um, you talk. Right. And it may sometimes it may just be um, you know, what were your impressions of this text? How did it differ from what you thought it would be? Um, we just read a chapter from Hitler's Mein Kampf last week, um, so they all have ideas about Hitler. But you know, how, how what was what was your experience reading this? What surprised you? What didn't surprise you? And I think I had everyone talk with a partner for sixty seconds first, and then we shared um, a lot of the feedback that came in, so kind of everyone starts talking. And then later in class, I had them break up into groups to discuss a particular passage, I think a set of particular passages that I thought would help them struggle with a big question that we face in interpreting the text. Um, but particularly with freshmen, if you just say discuss, nothing happens sometimes. Right. So sometimes I'll do things, discuss, and make a list of the top five um, reasons why X, Y, or Z. Or, you know, what is the most important line in this passage and and say why. But I often have them write. I mean, I had yesterday I had students, there was a, a set of passages I wanted to look at and they had to come up with uh, an answer to a question. And I had each group write, uh, first spend 10 minutes looking at the passages and then spend 10 minutes on the board drafting a paragraph. That would do X, Y, and Z. 
So, I mean, lots of really specific um, instructions. Then we discuss their paragraphs all together. Now, are these writing exercises, are, are they summer, kind of summaries? Or, or I'm, I'm trying to envision here what... I mean, they tend to be an, an, an analysis of a question. Okay. So an interpretive question that they need to an, an interpretive question that they need to answer by looking at a text carefully and analyzing it. And so, how did you come across this? Did you come across this idea to have them write in class, or it just sort of happened, or this is how you think maybe? And so, um, some of this comes from actually from language teaching. You know, when I when I teach the fifth semester German course, you know, you you want to practice them writing. And it's much better to have them work together on the board, writing three sentences that answer a question, having them correct each other's grammar and write in the best possible German and communicate well, than being the one instructor who always has to correct them. And I, you know, I find in, in those classes, I like the dynamic when I see them together working at the board, because you see them really thinking. But I mean, I think this is, it's, I, don't, I certainly didn't do this 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I would have sort of sat and just conducted a class discussion with me in the center. Right. Um, but my sense is, you know, they're, they'll, if I have something important to say, um, they'll listen to it more if they've been talking for a while, too. And then what I'm saying clearly builds on what they've um, been contributing to the discussion, whether it's, you know, struggling in their groups with something they can't quite formulate or writing something um, on the board where they, you know, they write that paragraph and finally at the end they have a sentence that they feel really encapsulates what I think is most important. Hmm. Well, that's, that's I think, going to be really helpful for our podcast. And we have a lot of young instructors here at MSU Northern. Um, I know that you also work with a lot of graduate students who are pretty new to teaching. Um, so do you have any advice for new instructors on be, beyond, you know, these reflections here that you've shared with us, just in general, how to plan and lead? No, I think I think the really important thing is that when you go into a classroom, you shouldn't te think about what do I want to teach, but what do I want the students to learn, and and how do I want them to learn that, and what's their process going to be. Mm -hmm. So not so sort of, you know, I want them to get to point B, but you know they're at point A. What what can I have them do? That's what I use. You know, what activity can I engage them in so that they can master this concept or skill. Thinking yeah. not so much about, you know, I have this knowledge, I want them to do it, or I want to teach critical thinking, which is which is often very vague, right? But what exercise can I create for them so that they're doing this themselves? Mm -hmm. So that they're doing something intellectually, not just knowing something, but like... Yeah, so they're doing something intellectually. Um, and, you know, listening to me talk is, you know, is not necessarily doing something intellectually. So much of this is, you know, it is like language teaching. They don't have the... They don't yet have the vocabulary to discuss the things that you want them to discuss in a sort of with the level of subtlety. So a lot of this is sort of creating exercises so they can master the vocabulary and the the you know linguistic precision so they can you know analyze a text or an issue and realize, ah, this is the tension here. But my sense is they do its best when they're trying to figure it out them when they're struggling to figure it out themselves. Well, well, thank you so much. I, I that you just gave us. I think a lot of ideas gave me a lot of ideas, and that's part of why I wanted to talk to you because you've always been really open to talking about process. Do you have any questions for me? Or no, I don't, I don't think so. Th thanks for doing this, and thanks for all the work you're doing. So, what did you guys think? First of all, I think he's absolutely right that you have to get your students to engage with the material before they come to class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that Whether, class pro. Yeah, it has to be. If they don't have any context to talk about the content, then there's no discussion. If they haven't done the reading or done an activity or whatever you want to discuss, how can you, how can you have a, a discussion with them? So his idea of, you know, giving them some kind of uh, little short answer quiz that they had to do before class based on the reading mm -hmm. and putting a grade on it, not a big grade, but but still a grade, I th think that's a good idea. Was there anything else that you talked about that you guys thought would be helpful? We can't really remember exactly what uh, he was referring to, but there was uh, some kind of project assignment or something that they would work on, and when they came to class, Regardless if they had the wrong answer, they would still get full credit for, mm -hmm. you know, the prep work yeah. essentially for the discussion. Yeah. 
And I really like that because he is also expanding on, well, this gives me an opportunity to work with him and, you know, not having the correct answer isn't necessarily a negative thing. And he was able to build something out of that and work with the students to get them to point B. Yeah. So, so that little short quiz before class is both a way to get the students to do the reading, but it's also a way for him to assess their understanding of it beforehand. So mm-hmm. it gives them a little bit of preparation to know where their mind is at before he comes to class. So I think that could be really helpful. Right. I also really liked what he said about um, leading discussion being a lot like or resonating a lot with him as a language teacher, as a foreign language teacher. So in foreign language teaching, you do have to, you can't just say, hey, discuss. You have to really build them up to the topic, mm-hmm. give them the language that they need, give them the, um, help them, train them to use the kind of formulations that you that you would use to talk about those things. And I, I don't know if that's always necessary in a, in a non-foreign language class, but certainly in the beginning, trying to help them formulate arguments um, and yeah. I think it's I think it's still necessary in a lot of 100 level classes when the students don't have that academic language or even just they just don't have experience talking about those kind of subjects and having a back and forth and, and sharing your opinion mm-hmm. and they do need a little bit of guidance on that sometimes mm-hmm. what do you think about his ideas for the having small discussion discussions in small groups before doing the the full classroom discussion i think that's key i think otherwise like he said you're gonna get three people who who are brave enough to talk yeah off the cuff in front of everyone and i think the rest um just sit there and wait for the other those three people to talk um and so it's sort of like private not private practice before public demonstration, but small group practice before yeah. demonstration in public, which I think is good. Yeah. And then the other way was uh, having them write something before discussing it mm-hmm. in class, you know, making a list or something like that before they talk about it out loud. Out loud I think that the whole group. Yeah, I think that also does the same thing. It gives them a chance to practice it with, without such a big audience before they they bring it up in front of everybody with some structure too. Yeah. Um, with, with a really specific structure, which I think is important uh, because otherwise they're just like, I don't, I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, what do you guys think we should, um, I think we're going to do part two on this. Uh, and maybe this is sort of face to face discussion, but maybe next time we can talk a little bit about online discussion. Yeah. I think we can do that. Because, I mean, obviously the two are connected, but they're different in a lot of ways. You know, online discussions, usually the instructor is trying to replicate that face-to-face experience. And it's not a perfect analog between the two of them. There are some things that you can replicate, and there's some things that you have to just do differently. And that's, that's a big challenge. Stay tuned for part two of this topic, where we talk about online discussions. Till next time.